Okay, so uh, my name's Harriet Bulkley and I work at the Department of Geography at the University of Durham. Uh, and uh, my main areas of interest are really climate change, politics and governance. And I've done a fair amount of work over the last 10 years or so on how cities around the world are responding to climate change. For us, we think about autonomy as um, rather than, as I said, rather than a kind of idea of separation or independence, it's more about self-determination, being able, a community or a city, being able to have a say in their own future, um, being able to create capacities and whether it's markets or other forms of institutions that provide them with what they feel are, are the important priorities for their communities. Well, one of the case studies that we looked at in, in the report was actually one to do with uh, climate change, and that was about what's been happening in London. And I think London is a really interesting city to look at how different responses of climate change are emerging because they're taking so many multiple forms. So you'll have something such as the Low Carbon Zones project, which was started by the Greater London Authority, tasking different... Uh, autonomous communities uh, with achieving 20.12% reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. And many of those communities were able to not only achieve reductions of that order, but also came up with new innovations to sustain uh, work on energy efficiency and reducing vulnerability to fuel costs in the local communities. So one case we mentioned is transition towns in Brixton, where transition towns work with the low carbon zone and have set up some new um, schemes and programs and a new energy co-op on the basis of the program. So you can see uh, from some little things, bigger things can grow. What is on the one hand a response to climate change is also a response to creating a local economy, addressing questions of vulnerability and providing a resource for a community. In Cape Town, one of my students, John Silver, has been working on some projects which retrofitted uh, low-income housing with new ceilings. On the one hand, a response to climate change, both adaptation, trying to improve the resilience of that housing to the impacts of climate change and reduce the amount of energy that they used. But equally, uh, a project which created employment in the area, which provided uh, healthier homes for people to live in, reduced sickness days and so on. So. Climate change is interesting because of the way in which it's been, in some, at least in some cases, able to cross over some of those traditional boundaries between what happens in cities. The autonomy of any one particular community or any one particular city or town is often shaped and uh, created and sustained by its links with other cities. Um, so one of the examples that we looked at in the report was some work that my colleague Colin McFarlane had done of a network called uh, Slum Shack Dwellers International, which started in communities in Mumbai but has since developed its learning and understanding about how to support um, poorer people in their housing needs and has networked internationally. And that, uh, that activity really, in, um, the activities of those organizations now in cities across India and Africa has been sustained and supported by being part of that network in a way that just one group in one particular slum area of India might not have been able to sustain for such a long time. So we really see that cooperation, that, that linkage between different urban areas Certainly in the UK, we don't have very much autonomy at the urban level about how energy or water services are provided. Um, there's more autonomy in the waste sector, uh, but still often those services are provided by large multinational corporations. Um, and the extent to which city authorities and their communities can shape those services is quite limited. That's one of the really interesting things, I think, in the energy areas that we are seeing now, a range of new kinds of forms of energy organization, whether that be energy co-ops or other kinds of forms of mutual ownership of energy resources, which are emerging um, in the UK, but also um, in Germany, where there's a big debate about the remunicipalization, which is a long word, <laughs> but the, the taking back into control uh, for the municipalities of energy services. And, that's a debate happening uh, in Berlin at the moment, uh, for example. So 
there are areas, particularly infrastructure and economic areas, where urban autonomy can be more limited. Well, I think one, one of the really interesting things is the way in which how we use energy is often um, as related to how we get it. When we think that we're getting energy from somewhere out there, big companies just making profits, we have very little control and, and say over our energy uh, and we probably don't care very much about it but what we've seen in community-based energy projects is that people get a lot more involved with their energy. They, they think of it as their own kind of resource and they want to look after it. Um, they want to make money from it but they also want to ensure that it's there in the future. So there's a, a kind of a change of, of approach to energy and what it is and it becomes seen as something a little bit more precious rather than than something that's taken for granted and over which you don't have very much control anyway. Yeah, well I think one of, one of the interesting things we have touched on before already is that these kind of agendas around environmental sustainability, climate change and energy futures are some of the areas where we've seen the most strong cooperation between cities and actually reasonably little competition. So some of the networks of cities that exist such as an uh, organization called ICLE, Local Governments for Sustainability, or there's a European organization called Energy Cities, or the C40 network of global cities. These networks between them collect about, well, 2,000, 3,000 cities all working in, the, in these areas. Uh, the recent agreement within the European Union called the Covenant to Mayors, I think now has over 5,000 signatories. So we're really seeing cities wanting to work together. So I, I think we need to be less concerned about the kind of competitive city and the idea that cities are out there to beat one another and, and more focus on what it is that has made cities want to cooperate with one another and how we can foster that. We're quite clear in the report that we're not trying to call for the kinds of urban autonomy where some cities will be able to separate themselves off and claim nice resources and great lifestyles um, for themselves and leave the rest of the world behind. That's not at all what, we, what we're suggesting. Instead, we really see this as a kind of networked form of self-determination. And we, in a sense, in the, in the paper, we're challenging ourselves and other people to think about autonomy a bit differently, not to think of it as separation, but in instead think about what powers the cities need in order to take their part in the transition for, for the global economy and for society as a whole. I think that's why across the Pathways project, as far as I understand it, there's going to be other work looking at how do we focus on adequate forms of participation and adequate forms of justice to accompany urban autonomy. So urban autonomy by itself won't be able to achieve the kinds of futures that we're interested in. You know, we can all come up with lots of, of, of examples of where global financial institutions or what's happened with the banks or economic processes um, really have led to significant harm for cities. You, know, you look at deindustrialization during the 1980s in many of the UK's northern cities, for example, and elsewhere globally, how, you know, that leaves devastation economically and socially and how cities can seem to be at the kind of whim of global economic affairs. So in some senses just withdrawing from that seems to be what you want to do. You want to hide from those kind of uh, processes and, uh, and try to sustain your own local economy. But on the other hand, those flows of finance, those flows of ideas and investment are also critical to the development of cities, and particularly cities in the global south who haven't had an opportunity to be part of the global economy and want to participate in those kind of processes. Um, but equally that they do provide resources that need to be marshaled to different um, ends. So here I think is a, is a question about what does a kind of progressive green economy look like? Could there be scope for cities to develop particular forms of economic provision? And energy is, another, is a good example, so would water or waste be here? services that are provided that pr create new forms of economic interaction, meaning that profits don't fly out with the uh, 
overseas locations of some of the headquarters of the big energy, water and waste companies, but instead recirculated locally. So it's really about working out what kinds of economic circulation cities can be part of and help to sustain, um, and giving them powers and capacities to be able to achieve that. What we're suggesting is that new forms of autonomy around questions of climate change, energy, water, can be the basis upon which housing improvement can be carried out. It's, you know, we're not going to address climate change if everybody still lives in rubbish housing, <laughs> because the energy just leaks out of it, it produces all the pollution, so we need housing to be decent in order to achieve that. Other research, and Andreas Luque, who was one of the co-authors on the report, has undertaken um, in Sao Paulo has shown how as uh, social housing providers there were thinking about how to improve the qual quality of life and the quality of housing for their tenants, they turned to solar hot water as a solution so that when people moved into their house they not only had a house but they had a, a good and cheap supply of hot water to go with it. Um, and that program is now being rolled out across Brazilian social housing. Uh, so it's become normal to expect to have cheap, low cost and, and plentiful resources along with decent housing and that's what decent housing should be about. But it, it is also about saying well rather than just thinking about energy efficiency for low income people, shouldn't we be thinking about providing them with sustainable resources? I mean, energy, energy efficiency helps you deal with your bills now but providing resources that can supply you in the future at low cost, that deals with your, you know, your whole future life as well. And I think that's what's very interesting when you see what's happening in cities like Sao Paulo and Mumbai and Cape Town and Bangalore is that they, they kind of some at least some parts of these cities have got that. They understand that um, to deliver on economic development, they also have to deliver on environmental sustainability. It should open up possibilities for people to think differently about their cities, whether that's about a housing, housing development, whether it's about what the economic future of that city should be about. It should be something which enables people to participate in making those decisions as well. So I think it should be exciting for um, people to kind of open up their horizons about what, what their possible futures might be. Um, I think it it also provides a possibility of making more of what we have already as well. I think it's, it's almost something, nothing more frustrating than seeing something really good, you know, in your local area or your city work for like a couple of years and then finish. And you think, well, why is that finishing? That was great. We really want to sustain that. place that I've done a lot of work in is Newcastle in Australia, it's where I did my PhD about 15 years ago or so, and uh, there the local authorities saved something like 40 or 50 percent of its energy bill, it's ploughed it back into energy efficiency projects and renewable energy across the city. So again, you can see, uh, you know, at a local authority level, in Australia at a time when the Howard government was like like the US um, government at the time was a, a denier of climate change and anti-Kyoto, you had cities across Australia and America taking forward climate change and energy agendas and uh, achieving savings in, in terms of cost but also creating new kinds of green housing that are low cost or new forms of energy services. So there's lots of examples where autonomy and self-determination around these agendas of sustainability and social justice have been productive. I think what we try to point to in the report is that at the moment that they re they remain um, rather fragmented and uh, or maybe more, more what we need to do is try to network those into a kind of distributed sense of autonomy so that we can bring them together while allowing them to retain their own um, self-determination. Friends of the Earth. The environmental group Friends of the Earth. Friends of the Earth. Friends of the Earth are actually quite good at getting laws passed.